just soon not have to deal with. But the Bible does deal with things like this. It does it in a proper way. Brother Johnny Oxendine will be our speaker, born in North Carolina. He has a degree in business. He's married 25 years to former Pamela Joan Hackworth, Noah Hackworth's daughter. He's preached in San Mateo now for 13 years there at the congregation. Preached in numerous lectureships in Texas, Nevada, California, and recently in England. And he's already slated to be there again. He just doesn't know it. Although he was tentatively set up to be there. He has had articles published in The Defender, Continuing for the Faith, and several lectureship publications. He's an excellent gospel preacher and sound in the faith. And we count him as a near and dear friend. And the Cones have special uh, interest in him because uh, he's the one they check on to see how well Keith is going. <laughs> Not really if Keith's listening. <laughs> come, and, <laughs> come and speak to us, John. Oh, that's funny. <clears throat> I almost uh, asked Brother Ken to take me and make sure I got a tuxedo to get that formal wear. <clears throat> and a few other comments I'd just like to make. Of course, I'm so thankful to uh, be here again with you. It's always a joy, a pleasure. Enjoy the hospitality of the cones and just with you, it feels like being home. It's just like home. Uh, I'm always amused when, when David gets up here and talks about how he's worried about his voice, but he talks more and longer than anybody else. <laughs> Where is Terry? <clears throat> and, oh, he's right behind me. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say before we started, uh, basically to Brother Chumley, is that he really didn't have to, he didn't really have to leave the Christian church to have fellowship with some people like Phil Sands. He could have just stayed right and, and been, you know, he just stay right there and nothing like Acts 19 and 3, but I'm sure that David asked me to take this subject because I live in California. At first I thought he was picking on me, but considering the fact that, as you all know, San Francisco is one of the most liberal areas, probably the most liberal area in this nation. I've mentioned it many times before on previous lectureships, uh, and if you are not familiar with some of the people who are identified with this particular area there, recently was this movie about one of the city council members who have been killed there, Harvey Milk, a pronounced um, homosexual. His only claim to fame is that the man who shot him and got off had eaten a lot of Twinkies. That was his defense. It is the area from which Gavin Newsom the mayor of San Francisco, who will also be running for governor of California, the early promoter of homosexual marriage, Diane Feinstein, Barbara Boxer, and Nancy Pelosi. These are all people in our area. So when someone says, what's it like in the Bay Area, that's, what's it, that's what it's like. <laughs> And that's just part of California. That's just Northern California. Because in Southern California, of course, you have all the TV and movie stars. And that, of course, there's just not enough time. I think I put it in a book. There's just not enough time to deal with all the celebrities and the celebrity wannabes and, and the people who are constantly in the news and who the young people, many young people see and look to as examples and people to follow. There's, there's Britney Spears. David Decovity, who, of course, known in, in TV for the X-Files and 
Uh, here is a person who had to be, I use the word hospitalized because he was uh, obsessed with pornography. I mean, he actually had to go into treatment because that was his obsession. And so when we, we look at all of this, it, it brings about for us a, a, a worrisome fact that, that these people become uh, newsworthy and, fa and objects of fascination. And people don't look at this for how disgusting it is, but rather they, they look at it, they're fascinated, and they're lured to the articles. So when we, we think about these kinds of things and the, the flow of movies, and I think I listened in the book, a number of movies came out last year, I believe it was last year, which by the titles themselves give us, give us an idea what are we dealing with in this country. When you hear a movie, and I, of course it's taken from, a from the television show, Sex in the City, Lust Caution, these already tell you what the subject matter is. These already tell you just by the title, you, don't, you, don't, you certainly don't want to go to the movie, but it just tells you where our society is. I want to go back to the uh, opening verses uh, that are listed in the book, Romans 1, 26, 27. I want to thank Brother uh, Jess for that outstanding lesson on homosexuality. I mean, that was, that was right where it ought to be and tells us where we ought to stand and what we ought to see the Bible teaching. God gave them up to vile passions, women changing natural use, and that which is against nature, and likewise also the men have the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust toward one another, men with men working, as it says, unseemliness and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error. And also, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 and 10, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom. Be not deceived, and Paul there, he gives a list that includes the type of people that we're talking about. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with men. We're talking about homosexuality. We're talking about sodomites. They shall not inherit the kingdom. I don't remember the exact date of uh, one of our bulletins, but we, we talked a little bit about an article in Newsweek magazine. And the woman was the religion editor there, and she wrote <clears throat> an article basically saying that, that the Bible does not actually condemn homosexuality that it is in some way a promoter of homosexuality. And so when we, we see these things, then go back to the sexual revolution. Uh, and here is, is where we, we really want to look at what the Bible says. Uh, as I mentioned in the book, there's a, there's a part there about uh, a radio commentator, Bernie Ward in San Francisco, held, held a radio program. I might have mentioned this before. He had a radio program called God Talk, and yet he was arrested for being a pedophile. Now, the only reason they arrested him, as I, as I said, is it was a federal case, and the San Francisco city couldn't, didn't have anything to do with it. Otherwise, he'd probably be still on the streets. <clears throat> but there are lots of periods that we could talk about and begin to begin our study, begin to look at this. Uh, we, could, we could look at early Rome, we could look at the, the, uh, the story of the life of Caligula, of, of Nero, we could, we could look at the Marquis de Sade, we could look at all sorts of, we could look at the 60s. And in the 60s, of course, out in San Francisco, flower children and, the, and free love. We want to look at some examples of immorality in the Old Testament. We want to look at a, one example in particular and ask ourselves a question, where, what do we find in the scriptures on the subject of morality? And we say, our period of time is really bad, and it is. But there were some episodes in the Old Testament as well that really spoke to that age. And I think when we look here, we see that our, our generation, as, wor as, as bad as it is, uh, we can imagine even worse. Because all through the history, we see it even in Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, that man has variously defined categories of, of lustful endeavors, and here to the point that it displeased God that he had even made man. 
And so when we, we look at the attempts by people to find a consensus, to find people looking for more and more of a majority of people uh, condoning this type of activity. And again, in San Francisco, in, in California, we had that Proposition 8. Proposition 8, as, as you know, was passed to the disdain of the homosexual community. And they're not done. I'm going to come back to the Old Testament. I didn't forget about that, so don't. I see you looking at me. I just thought I, I move like this. <laughs> this is an issue that, as I think Brother Chilton was talking about in England, this is an issue that in California has really began uh, to heat up. Because ever since that proposition passed, the homosexual community has begun a broad-based attack on anyone who is a supporter of that proposition. And they go online now, and recently the, uh, the, the courts ruled against uh, an effort to prevent the names of people voting and providing support for Proposition 8 from having their names on the Internet. But the courts said, no, they have to have the names up there. And the homosexual community has begun a systematic attack on anyone, their businesses, uh, their careers, their op various operations they may have, and they have put people out of business. They they've caused people to lose their jobs, and they and they had protests a plenty, and they're not going to stop. And and in March, I believe it is that the courts will rule again on this matter, and if they lose in the courts, they're going to bring it back on the on the ballots in California to the to the people. And if they lose again, they're going to take it back again. They're not going to stop. And this is not just in California. This is going to be nationwide. It's a problem nationwide. Now, just as the sun comes up in the east and sets in the west, probably on the day of judgment, California might be the first to feel the fire. <clears throat> Because it's over there that we just have so much of this to deal with on a regular basis, but it is something that they are, and it's an attack against religion. It's not an attack against the people who actually voted for the proposition so much as an attack against religion. Now going back to the Old Testament, this immoral behavior, we want to look over in Genesis chapter 39 and verse 7. <clears throat> because it was certainly something not foreign to Potiphar's wife. As we, we look there, it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her, her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. That tells us a lot of things there. Every day he had to get away from this, this woman, from the grasp of this woman who had no consideration at all for her marriage vow. She was an immoral person. And she ultimately ac accused him of sin when he would not oblige her advances. And the Bible continues to tell us down in verse 10, she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her. And so we see the circumstances there, an immoral situation, the sexual revolution, pornography, immorality. And here's a woman who, in a position uh, where she felt she could take advantage of this young man, she pursued him on a constant basis. And we can look at this as an analogy. We can look at this as an illustration of the kinds of things that we're faced with, that people are faced with on a regular basis, this sort of harassment. And it reveals a mindset that continues even today, but with the possibility of much less outrage. People are not as outraged as they ought to be. We are not as outraged as we ought to be. And sometimes it's a timidity. People are refusing to take a stand. I'll tell you, Brother, Brother Whitlock, if you came out there to California and preached that lesson in the middle of San Francisco, I'd have to come get you. I'd have to come get you because they'd be, that, they'd be after you with, with arrows all up and down Castro Street. Uh, if you notice in Castro Street on uh, Halloween, they usually have about 200,000 homosexuals out there in the street. And they're dressed up, and you wouldn't even want to look at them. It's so sickening and disgusting. I know it's on the Internet. I wonder if I'll hear about it, but this is the problem that we're dealing with. 
And then, of course, we, we think about those who are opposed to it. And how do they view you? You are intolerant. You are old-fashioned. You are the person who has the problem. And we see it every day out there with, with young ladies as they go to high school and, and they have these, they barely address. And it's become just a thing of the community. It's become a matter of life. And it's gotten to the point now that when we, when we see these things, how do they concern us? And the churches need to be speaking out more against it and individuals taking more of a stand against it. But when we go back, we see that even in the Old Testament, they had these problems. Potiphar's wife, no concern for her marital vows at all. In the New Testament, I just want to point out an example that's found over in the book of John chapter 8, the woman caught in the act of adultery. And how this situation has it unfolded, and here, addressed in the gospel, in the, in the epistles here, but here is a situation where the punishment for these actions are discussed in the Old Testament. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 20 and verse 10, and the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 22 and verse 22, where it talks about the punishment for the sin of adultery. And it says that both, of course, shall be put to death. Now, when we go back and look at this situation as it is described to us in the Scriptures, and they come to Jesus, and they come to him wanting to know, they're asking, they're wondering if he is going to relax, perhaps, the, uh, the, mor the morals, the, pu the public morals forbidding this sort of action. They want to know what Jesus is going to say. They want to put him to the test. You see, this is the way that it always is a switch. Instead of looking at what the Bible says about morality, about sexual uh, issues, they take what we try to teach and preach and turn it around and make us the bad people. We're not tolerant of them. We're not accepting of them. And in San Francisco, uh, if you're not accepting of the homosexual community, then obviously you're a target of derision. You're a person, you're, you're a persona non gratis, I believe that's how it goes. They don't even want you in the city. But we see here that Jesus takes that opportunity. He takes the opportunity that's presented to him to teach. And here, of course, on a very different matter entirely, but it's interesting that the view of adultery at that time was a serious matter. Now just think about that. They brought this woman to Jesus because the sin of adultery was a serious matter, or should have been a serious matter to them. But if you think about adultery today, adultery today is elevated almost to the status of cute. It's almost in. It's almost hip. They almost wonder what's wrong with you if you have not been involved in an affair. And you look at how it's portrayed on, the te on, on television or in the movies, and they, you almost don't even have a story unless you have some people involved in an affair. They can't figure, they can't make a story. And this, is, and this, this type of thing, it emanates, it, it just oozes out from the tube on to, into the minds of young people. And they see this, and it affects marriage, it affects the home, it affects marriage. And ultimately, that affects society, that affects culture. And we see the effect of that on the church. You have congregations, they won't touch the marriage issue. The congregation across on the other side of the freeway from where we are in San Mateo, if you went and preached the truth in Matthew 5, Matthew 9, 19, if you went and preached the truth in that congregation, 60, 65 percent of the people in that congregation will leave. They are not going to listen to what Jesus taught on Matthew 19. Their way around that, or their attempt to get around that, because there's obviously no way to get around that, is to say that the Gospels are not New Testament. That's Old Testament. And so whatever Jesus said there is not relevant. And they make all of these other excuses which really don't make any sense. But the idea is you have at least 60-65% of that congregation, if they're not involved in a, in a, a marriage that's not really a marriage, then they at least condone it. They know someone else who is in an adulterous situation or relationship. 
And we find that more and more congregations are less willing to discipline along those lines. And so, yes, we see how it's being dressed up in formal. Well, not just in the society, but even in churches. As we continue on with some of the thoughts here, this, this becomes for some people almost a badge of honor. That's how they want to be known. They don't want it to be, they don't want to be curtailed by a piece of paper, uh, just as the advertising uh, for one of these uh, television shows, it's, t it's titled Nip Tuck. And all you have to do is just, you, you, you can hardly even watch the, the advertisement when they promote it. And it tells you that all it's about is adultery. All it's about is sex with someone that's not their wives. And they, and they try to hide these little shows that, you know, it comes on at 9, it comes on at 10, it's on channel 36 or something like that. But it, it becomes a part of the culture. And more and more and more of these, and I think someone mentioned this, and we'll come back to television uh, in a moment, but few people concern themselves with the residual effects of this. What happens to the mind of the Christian watching these things on a regular basis? You begin to think, it's all right. It's not really affecting me. It's not bothering me. And everybody else is watching it as well. We have to ask, how much of this liberty, how much of this sexual freedom, how much of this is the Lord willing to allow us uh, in this or any other culture? We go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And there, of course, looking at verses 9 through 11, it says, Be not deceived. Not only as Paul wrote it in that particular, in that particular time, addressing the Corinthians. You, you say, well, I wonder what it was like in Corinth. And if you want to know what it was like in Corinth, just come on to San Francisco. And so I wonder what it was like. What was Paul dealing with there with those brethren? If you have, you just get yourself a little, you know, vacation and come on out there. You can, you can worship with us. But you go up to San Francisco and you'll see what it's like. But he says, be not deceived. Paul says, don't under any set of circumstances think that you're fooling yourselves. He says, none of these people, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, and that covers it all. These people shall not inherit the kingdom. And in many denominational groups, I would hope not any churches of Christ, but in many denominational groups, these are people who certainly think of themselves as with the possibility of going to heaven. Let's go down a little bit further in that same chapter. Chapter 6, verses 13. Because the Bible tells us the purpose of the body. He says, the body is not for fornication, but the Lord. He says, and the Lord for the body, God both raised the Lord and will raise us up through his power. Your bodies are the members of Christ. People in the world today think that they can do anything, that there are no consequences, there's no residual effects. Know ye not that, ye, that he that is joined to a harlot is one body. That's not the attitude of people in the world today. That's not the mindset. It's a casual affair. It's uh, in the vernacular of some of the teens or, or young adults. It's a hookup. It's just a casual thing. They just come together for sex and it doesn't mean anything. And so that is a question. Are we just dressing this up? Has it become such a part of society that it doesn't mean anything anymore? He that is joined unto the Lord as one spirit flee fornication. You know, oftentimes in, in San Mateo, and I'm sure in, in the pulpits of you brethren throughout uh, different parts of Texas and the country, the idea of repentance is almost foreign to some people. We've talked about this many, many times. The idea of repentance is foreign because you have to, Jesus said in Luke 24, that repentance and remission of sin will be preached in his name. But when you, pe when you preach repentance, you're preaching against sin. And the word sin is so foreign to the minds of people. I was in a conversation with a woman. She's an intelligent woman. So she was a school teacher. Uh, and she asked me the question, what exactly is sin? When a person asks you that question, you know, they already know the answer to the question. They already know the answer. 
And she was, she was in the process. I didn't know how the whole story was going to unfold. She was in the process of a divorce from her husband. And what I did not know is that she was, she was moving into a transition into a relationship with another woman. So when I explained to her what sin was, it wasn't that she liked that definition at all. But she continued on into that relationship. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that commendeth fornication sinneth against his own body. And I think people need to understand that. The Bible tells us that our bodies belong to Christ, not to be sullied through fornication, sexual immorality. And we look at that point. That's a very important point to understand. Our bodies belong to Christ. The Bible says we are not our own, we're bought with a price. <clears throat> we are instru instructed to abstain from fornication. And that, that, that word, flee fornication, flee, means to run away from so as to escape. And that idea, again, that idea, you know, this, the, the culture that we are in is, is really encouraging people to do the opposite. Not flee fornication, but look around for more. Working, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be at work. I'll tell the secretary to tell my wife if she calls, I'm out to lunch or something like that. Tell her all of these things so that I can engage in an affair. So that's the way the world is operating. That's the way it's working. And they, they promote this through the media. The idea of, of what used to be family-oriented, brother, just again mentioned about McDonald's because I was, I was right on that tag too. McDonald's and Disney, big promoters of the homosexual agenda. They even allowed them to have. I don't know about in Florida, but I, they allowed them to have those homosexual marriages, as they call them, in Disneyland. They think it's cute, and they they were on the board for a number of those lesbian, gay. LGBT and all of those groups and committees. Now, what you think about Corinth, that contemptible place? In First Corinthians chapter five, Paul, when he rebuked and remanded the brethren there, he says, "You should rather have mourned the situation." He says, "But, but rather than that, you are puffed up." And I think today, when we look around and we talk to the, the average person, not just the people in the church, but even the average person doesn't see anything wrong with the circumstances that we have in the country today. This is tearing at the fabric of our nation. And when we think about what is the problem, you know, I'm not interested right now in this whole, the whole stimulus plan and all of that. <laughs> the, the problem is a moral fabric is being rent. That's the problem. And I think it was Brother Chumley, I, I'm going to give him credit for it anyway, he said if people follow the Bible, there wouldn't be any of these problems. Now that may be true uh, in a large extent. It may not solve all of the problems, but if these, if people follow the Bible, we know they won't, but if they did follow the Bible, there would be fewer of these problems. Paul said, rather than, than mourn, you're puffed up. You're, you're, it's a badge of pride to you that you have a person in your congregation that you know that's in a, in a, involved in an illicit sexual relationship, and you are not doing anything about it. Brethren, do not ever let that happen in your congregation. And if it happens, jump on it immediately, and if there's a problem, then I guess you're going to have to leave. Because you cannot let people in the church be involved in these or any other types of sin without discipline. Not so, just not discipline. But discipline is a part of it. This, cur this current moral crisis that we have. And again, we think of the states that have been mentioned, the states that have been uh, discussed as having all of the California, Massachusetts, Connecticut. It's a march into the abyss of sin. And it's not going to stop. 
And as was mentioned before, and I, I, Brother Jeff, I'm just going to follow right in your trail. Homosexuality is a sin. It is a sin. And there is nothing acceptable about it, and there is no place in the Bible that you can find that will condone it, that will, that will appease it, that will mollify it in any way. And the brethren have to speak out on this because that's going to be a group that we're going to be dealing with in some way or another. The Word of God is clear. Genesis 19, Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6. Fornication is a word that certainly can be defined, uh, it covers all types of sexual activity outside of lawful, God-ordained marriage. I'm going to have to talk about a subject that is really disgusting, that's pornography. And I know you don't even want to have to think about that. On October the 8th, I'm going to read this. It's in the book. There was a press release that stated that American Airlines would start to filter and block pornography on its Internet service during flights. I didn't even know that they allowed that. And shame on them for doing it. Now, I want you to imagine having to sit sit next to someone on an airplane and that's what they're looking at. I want you to imagine how callous and unconcerned and insensitive to any type of morality a person sitting next to you could be watching this type of filth in public. Because it's very difficult to watch anything on an airplane that someone else can't see. And if a person's watching something like that on an airplane and a child could be sitting in the seat right behind him, could be sitting right behind him, look right through the little crack there. And so the fact that they even allowed that is shameful. And I think it's just it's as disgusting as, as it can be. And here are some, this is from 2006, most of this data, because in 2007 they hadn't collected it all, so imagine that this is probably escalated from the time that I got this information. It says, according to recent data, in 2006, every second, there are 28,000 users viewing pornography on the Internet. 29,000 people a second. And it says that every 39 minutes, which is about the length of a lesson, so when I'm finished, there'll be a new pornographic movie or something on the Internet. Every 39 minutes, a new pornographic video is uploaded. And considering that they have widened the bandwidth, considering that there are now more and more ways to get things up on the Internet, YouTube and everything else, we can only imagine with these webcams, we can only imagine how much more has been uploaded per minute. And it is a pandemic problem. Worldwide pornography industry is larger than the revenues of the top technology companies combined. That includes Microsoft, Google, Amazon, eBay, Yahoo, Apple, Netflix and Earthling. The revenue from pornography. And it says that it exceeds the combined revenues of the major networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And he said, well, that must be a large problem. When you have that much pornography, that means that there are so many people who are involved on this on a large scale. This is not something that's just happening in San Francisco. This is not something that's just happening in Houston or Austin. This is not something that's just happening in a little place here and there. This is something that is everywhere. The data contained, it says 12% of the total number of websites, 12% and rising, the number of websites in the world that are dedicated only to pornography. 
25% of search engines, that's Google. You know, you don't even, unless you use Yahoo, maybe you do. But most of the time people get on the internet, they just say, I'll just go to Google. One out of four searches is for pornography. One out of four. You would think that with a tool like the internet, people will be looking up things that would provide information. They'd be getting some historical data. Some, one out of four is pornography. 35% of all the internet downloads. That's more than one out of three. Pornography. And in this country, 89% of the pornography websites this is where they're located. 89% of the pornography web pages in the world are in the United States. Most of that is located in California. And this is something that, of course, is so addictive. I, I'm not going to get into uh, all of that, but the idea, the comparison with a person who becomes addicted to pornography is as bad as crack cocaine. And they said once a, per a person gets hooked into that sort of thing, psychologically it's very difficult to pull them out. And we think about now, some of you probably uh, techies or geeks out there, you heard that we need a new internet, that we need more bandwidth. Well, you can see why. It's already the pipes are clogged with filth. And we need to figure out some way to get some Drano through there and clean that stuff out. Because it's sickening when you think of the numbers. You know, you and I, we go onto the Internet and we're looking for information. We're looking for something uh, substantive, something substantial. But many of the people who are using it, you wondering at home, uh, Brother Cohn wondering, oh, why is my Internet so slow? I can't get my download. Well, I, I no, because you've got half the people out there trying to download pornography. This is the problem that we're dealing with. You know, people say, well, that's a private matter. And that's the way they want to think of it. Three minutes? Okay. TV. That's all I have to say. You know TV is sick. It is no longer a suitable environment for children. It's just not. Someone mentioned it in, another, in one of the lessons, the idea. You look at the characterization that they have in so many of these programs. They're trying to, through the use of these programs, push the homosexual agenda. You've got homosexual characters shown in a favorable light on that nip tuck, the office, Grey's Anatomy, uh, Ugly Betty, and who knows how many more. And they keep pushing that out there. And say, oh, well, that's not so bad. It's worse than that. As a matter of fact, they fired a, one of the characters off of Grey's Anatomy because he made a comment about one of the homosexuals on the, on the and they fired him. So that tells you what's going on. Uh, no longer surprised to hear obscenity spewed out on TV. You'd be amazed now when you think about how much of that actually comes out. It, it's, it's a problem, and the movie industry is worse. What used to be, I mean, you think about G, G rating, and I have something in the article about the rating system. G is non-existent now. The only thing that's G is, is some Disney. And if you think PG used to be PG, it's not. PG now is what used to be X, almost. And PG-13 and, and NC-17, they don't even need labels for that. They just should say pornography, nudity, profanity, and violence. That's all it ought to say, because that's what's up there. And so here, uh, just wanted to go back to James chapter 1, verse 27, where it says that we ought to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. That we as the Lord's people, that we have to take a stand against this. We cannot water down sin. We must confront it. We must contend against it. We must continue to fight the good fight. We must 
preach with the fervor of, of Moses to maintain what good there is and convert what can be extracted uh, for this sinful and perverse generation. There is definitely a fight. And we say, well, there's a political fight. There, there are political fights, to be sure. But there is certainly a fight for the moral fiber of this country. There's a fight in the home. There's a fight through the media. There's a fight just about everywhere you look. In the church, we, uh, we cannot back down from this. And so if you're, the encouragement is that you brethren from the pulpit take a stand and push that information out to the congregations, have classes on how to defend the gospel or whatever is needed. Because this is the world that we live in, and it's real. We can't be in, enclosed or isolated or separated from reality. This is what we're dealing with. And again, I, I want to thank you for being here. And the question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And I think we need to, again, I want to thank Brother Jess for that outstanding lesson, the one on abortion as well, because that's also a big problem. And, in, and out in the Bay Area... Uh, they're against you killing anything but babies. You know, you, you, better not, you better not touch a skunk or a squirrel or a raccoon or a baby seal, nothing. But if you want to kill a baby, then you're free, to, you're, free to, you're free to go. And so when we look at the kinds of society and, and what happens in, in that area is what you'll find soon in your neighborhood. So brethren, be ready. Take up the fight and contend for the faith. Thank you. Well, Brother Johnny has just added to the wealth of good information and good sermons that we've had thus far and we expect to continue to have them. Brother Johnny, thanks so much for that excellent lesson. You're so encouraged to know men who still stand for the truth the churches that back them it's so good not that we didn't know it but it's just good to experience it and hear it um, one of the things that just is a must and i noticed it showed up a little bit johnny when you said well over the internet i may get some reaction we've got to quit saying this to ourselves and get out there and say it to the people who's going to shoot back now that's where the problem's going to be we could say this to ourselves and we need to in, do it, that is, to exhort one another. But I don't, I don't know that many people here, some of them may have these secret sins, uh, are, are in need of this as much as we need it to exhort us to get out and influence the public. And when you read the book of Acts, what were they doing? Preaching to one another? The reason the world was turned upside down from the worldly mind's viewpoint is that they were out there mixing it up. They were out there having fingers shook in their face. They were out there uh, being stoned. They were out there being put in jail. Now, let me ask you something. We are the light of the world. We are the leavening of the earth for good. God expects us to do that. You see, we've been so long in a society to where most everybody backs what you hear now. That's changing, folks. And what are we going to do? Some of our brethren are already proven that when you put enough pressure in the right place, it doesn't touch top, side, bottom, or edge of what we're talking about, they'll collapse. But a few years ago they didn't, and that just matters in the church. So what about the people out? A few times we've put something on this sign. By the way, buddy, when you put something like that back out here on this sign? Uh-oh. <laughs> you see what happens. And uh, every time we put something, it even hinted at homosexuality, we've got reaction. Well, imagine if we had had this same lectureship dealing with these problems in a public place. What would happen? We'd advertise it in the papers, and like we did the debate with the Roman Catholics. What would happen? I'm telling you, uh, it's easy to sit here and do what we're doing. We do need to remind ourselves of it. We do need to do these things to keep ourselves on top of things. We need to be mindful that the church is expected to be militant and carry this truth right there into the very heart of evil. All you have to do is look to the divine pattern and see what Paul did. I remember Brother Warren so much saying over and over again that they took the gospel into the very synagogue and said to the Jews who didn't believe Jesus Christ was the Messiah, Son of God, and Jesus himself said, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Well, that seems rather harsh, don't you think? So that's what we're saying. 
And so we've got to realize that what he said today needs to be on this internet and it needs to be anywhere else. And we need to be prepared to take what they shoot back. And now I'm shooting blanks. These folks are out for blood, hair, skin, bone, teeth, and everything else. And they don't mind doing it. And you better boast yourself. This is not leave it to Beaver's world anymore. It's just not. I'm sorry to say, it's just not. I wish it was in a lot of ways. But it's not. So thanks again, and let us be exhorted to go out and do what's right in all of these things. You stand to judge.